Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, welcome. Glad that you're here this morning. So how's everybody holding up out there after uh, another week of chaos? You know, it's interesting that um, I'm finding, just like we talked about last week, if you were here last week and we talked about that burial season, and uh, there's two different extremes when it comes to responses to what's going on, because there's two different opinions. Um, and uh, a lot of us have found ourselves on one side of the extreme or the other. And it's been very interesting to see, even more so over the last week, how depending on what extreme you're on will determine how you respond to the chaos that we're in. It's interesting, I found myself this week, even even after last week, of preaching to myself about what I should be doing, I found myself this week in a pattern of trying to control the narrative of this whole coronavirus pandemic. I found myself being fearful, not so much that I would catch coronavirus, but found myself being fearful of the unknown. I like to be in control. I like to know what the end is, okay? And we don't know that yet. I don't know that yet. With every day that, that we wake up and we see um, a new uh, news conference and some new guidelines, so to speak, the thought pattern comes into my mind is I'm losing control over the narrative. I'm losing control over my schedule. I'm losing control. It would almost be as if, if they would just come out and say, Jake, you need to lock yourself up in your house and you can come out on May the 1st. And when you come out on May the 1st, everything will be back to normal. I can deal with that because I know the end game. And when I don't know the end game, when I'm out of the loop per se, I feel like I begin to lose control. And so what I do in an unhealthy way, and I know nobody else does this, this is just me. What I do is I begin to try to control the narrative. And so what I do is if I'm scrolling through Twitter or I'm scrolling through Facebook and I see something that fits my narrative, I like that. If I see something that doesn't fit my narrative, that just goes away. Because I need to feed myself with people, memes, articles that feed my narrative. Now, I know I'm not the only one. Because I scroll through Facebook and I see some of your posts. And I see some of your Twitter. And I see some of your responses to what's going on. And I think the trap that we have fallen into, and I really don't mind saying we this morning, because even if you were like me, I started off last week staunch in my faith, and I still am, that I wasn't going to get caught up in this. I found myself still trying to control this narrative. And so what I think is happening is, is we have begun to respond to this crisis in a way that maybe we need to take a step back and rethink. And so I started asking myself the question, why do I do this? Why do I do this? Well, I mentioned one is control. 
I need to be in control. And I think another underlying um, element to all of this is even if you're like me, and even if you are um, so, so secure in, in everything that's going on and your trust in God and, and all of that good stuff, and even if you were to say, I am not afraid, I do think there's an underlying fear of the unknown in all of us. Listen, let's be, let's be real. We don't know what's going to happen. And so I was reminded of something this week that I want to share with you this morning because at the end of the day, the experts on all of this, they can't even agree. The experts, the ones that are supposed to be controlling the narrative, are letting the narrative get out of control because they can't agree on next steps or what's going to happen next. How long is this going to last? I've heard everywhere from two weeks to two months to three months until the fall. Nobody really knows. And so I had this realization this week that the world is starting to find out what we as Christians should already know. None of us are in control. None of us are in control. And none of us have this figured out. The problem is, is that we expect the world to respond a certain way when unknown chaos creeps in. They're going to respond the way the world responds. But here's the question that I want to challenge you with today because I was challenged with it this week. How am I supposed to be responding in times of crisis and chaos? So we talked about last week this whole idea of burial, that we're in this burial season. And I challenge you with a couple of things. Number one, during this season, find out what God has for you. And then number two, find out what he wants you to do in the midst of the situation that we're in. And so I had a friend of mine send me a podcast. Many of you know Life Church in Oklahoma City, Craig Crochelle, who is a phenomenal uh, teacher. And they have campuses all over the country. And he sent me a podcast Craig Crochelle was actually quarantined for 14 days because he had been exposed to coronavirus. And during that 14 days, God spoke to him. And it was the most incredible podcast I think I've ever heard. And it so fits what I think we should be going today. And so if you know anything about Life Church, Life Church puts all of their material online. It is free to anybody that wants to study it. And uh, we have full permission today because I think he made three key points that I took to heart this week and I want to pass those on to you because at the end of the day I still believe what I talked about last week. We are in a season of burial and we don't know how long we're going to be here but in this time as we're passing through this crisis knowing that there will come a day where we are on the other side of this how are we supposed to be responding if you have your Bibles, I want you to look at a passage just really quick. If not, it'll be on the screen. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And then listen to what he says in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so I want to present a question to you today. How will we respond? You know, this passage is very interesting. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. I was reminded of a very important truth this week, is that the world is going to do what the world is going to do. And me as a Christ follower, I do not need to be conformed into the world's response to what's going on right now in our country. That there are two different responses that should be going on. The world's response and then the response of the church. 
The response of those of us that have Christ in our life, that call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And so what I want to do today is give you three areas where we as the church need to be responding differently to this crisis than the world does. Number one, I want to remind you, as I was reminded this week, we walk by faith and not by sight. Paul mentions that in 2 Corinthians, but I want to take you to John 14. Jesus is about to leave his disciples, and he makes an interesting statement in John 14. 1. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God believe also in me. He made that statement knowing that he was about to be crucified and knowing that he was about to leave this world and these disciples that had been walking with him for three years were going to be left all alone without Jesus in the flesh and he told them literally don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in God. Trust the process. There's something bigger going on here. And I think in our response, we need to be walking by faith and we need to be reminded of where our faith is. In, four, in John 14, 27, he goes on to say this, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. That is so huge. Not as the world gives. Then he says again, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. As I mentioned earlier, whether we want to believe it or not, I do believe there's an underlying element of fear because we don't know and we can't control the narrative. Jesus reminds us, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, our response in a time of unknown, our response in a time where it seems to be chaotic, is we need to remember that we walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus told his disciples, you, you listen, you're, you're not going to see me. I'm going away. But just because you don't see me, I need you to continue to walk by faith. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And then he says, I am leaving you peace. Not as the world gives. Because the world doesn't give us peace. The world gives us CNN, Fox News, Twitter, Facebook. The world gives us chaos. The world gives us fear. The world controls the narrative from a fearful place. Jesus has given us a gift. And maybe this doesn't apply to you, but it applies to me because I had begun to forget the gift of peace that Jesus has left, not just for me, but for all those that call him Savior and Lord. This is the essence of faith. See, the essence of faith is not, and I'm not talking about faith where you have a preacher or somebody tell you, if you just have enough faith, you can be healed from this coronavirus. Or if you just have enough faith, your house will be protected from the chaos. If you just have enough faith, you will have an abundance of toilet paper and paper towels. That's not faith. Trusting faith is Receiving the peace that Jesus offers in times of chaos. Jesus made a very important point to his disciples. Don't let your hearts be troubled, but what did he say? Trust in God. The essence of faith is trusting God and knowing that you're not in control and that he is. Listen, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know how long we're going to have to quarantine or how long restaurants are going to be closed. And the world wants to offer you fear in the chaos, but we as Christians need to be reminded that Jesus offered peace if we trust him. You see, we live by faith, not by sight. You see, sight tells us the economy is tanking. Sight tells us that the world is shutting down. Sight tells us that you can't go to restaurants anymore and that you can't uh, go to the grocery store and get meat. 
Sight tells us that people are going absolutely bonkers. Sight tells us that we are in a crisis. But faith tells us none of that is true. Faith tells us that we are not in a crisis, that we are passing through a crisis. Faith tells us that God is in control. Faith tells us that no matter how the world wants to act, if they want to go bonkers, I choose to live in peace because I trust that God's in control. Faith tells us it may be Friday, it may be Saturday, but at some point, Sunday is coming. Amen? Faith tells us that we can put our trust in God. You see, our sight wants to put our trust in the government to get us through this crisis. Faith tells us that we put our trust in Almighty God. And so we walk by faith and not by sight. The second principle is this. We respond in crisis by living sacrificially, not selfishly. Think about this for a second. We as Christians are called to respond in, in, in times of crisis by living sacrificially, not selfishly. Now, technically, we are selfish by nature. Technically, we are selfish by nature. If you've ever raised children, you know you do not have to teach them to be selfish. You didn't have to pull them into a room when they were two years old and show them how to take something that wasn't theirs, scream mine, and hit you when you tried to take it back. That comes naturally. We are prone to be selfish in our sin nature. But as Christians, as those that have been redeemed through the blood of Christ, we are called to live sacrificially. Paul makes a statement in Philippians 2. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have seen the world look after their own interests? I mean, just the fact that we can't find toilet paper, paper towels, meat, things like that tells us that people have gone completely nuts and have literally stocked up their homes. How many of us as Christians have done the same thing? Now listen, I'm not here to condemn anybody. I want us to think because I think there's a balance between preparing ourselves but also remembering our response in time of crisis has got to be different than what the world is doing. See, the world is hoarding and stockpiling and hunkering down. We as Christians have been called to do something totally different. And Paul made that statement that we should be like Jesus who put the interest of others ahead of his own, that we should also be thinking of other people. In Acts chapter 2, the early church is described as um, a church that came together. And in verse 44, it said, all who believed were together and had all things in common. It said they were selling possessions and belongings and they were distributing proceeds to all who were in need. Listen, church. Listen to me. I know many of you were at home last week. I was up here. <laughs> there are a lot of people in our community that are in need. And this crisis has um, really ballooned that need. They weren't able to get to Brookshire's uh, before the meat sold out. They weren't able to get to the dollar store before the toilet paper uh, sold out. The kids that are not going to school... The backpack kids, there's still a need there. And while we watch the world go crazy and hoard, we have an opportunity as the church to really step in and be generous. You know, I made a Facebook Live this week and I made a statement and I believe this statement with all my heart. God was good to us the first three months of this year. Your faithfulness in giving set us up 
for such a time as this. I really believe that. Your generosity has put us in a place where we can still give out food, where we can still pay the bills to run this live stream, where we can still help those financially, where we can still do ministry. And it's because of your generosity that has set us up for this. And it's going to be because of your generosity that is going to get us through this. Listen, the world is responding by hunkering down. The world is responding by closing their checkbook. The world is responding by hoarding their food. The world is responding by looking inward at themselves and themselves only. We've been called to put others first. We have a great opportunity, church, to step up and be generous. With our money, with our time, and with our energy, now more than ever, I believe there are going to be people that look to us for a different response than what the world is giving them. Ministry is still going on. Our preschool, our kids, our students, our um, benevolence, love one, backpacks, all of that is still going on. It just looks a little different. And while the government may say you can't gather uh, if 10 people or more, and while the doors of the church may technically be closed, the gospel is not shut down. Ministry is not shut down. We have an opportunity to minister to this community like never before. And so while the world responds by hoarding, we respond by living sacrificially and we give and we help and we pull together our resources. Literally, we respond by living sacrificially, not selfishly. And the last point is this, and this one's huge. We respond by shining our light, not hiding it. It's interesting, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power comes from God and not from us. We are afflicted in every way. Anybody feel afflicted over the last week? says we are afflicted but we are not crushed we're perplexed anybody been perplexed this week but we are not driven to despair we are persecuted but not forsaken we are struck down but not destroyed Paul's making the case that in this fragile jar of clay that is our earthly body God has put something very valuable in us and he has called us to take that out into the world and to shine the light of Christ. And here's what I know. I know that when things are at its darkest moment, that's when the light of Christ can shine its brightest. We've been called to shine that light, not hide it. You say, well, what do you mean by not hiding? Well, let me just challenge you because I have begun to see some people take the self-quarantine challenge and literally begin to hide. That's a worldly response. I believe we as the church have been called to be wise in our social distancing, to be wise if we're to be quarantined. But guys, we still have avenues to shine. This is not a time for us as a church to shut down. This is not a time for us as the church to quit. This is not a time for us as the church to sit back and wait and see what happens. This is a time for us to shine. This is a time for us to engage people with the gospel. This is a time for us to step out of our comfort zones and actually begin to initiate gospel conversations. Don't distance yourself. Don't fall into the trap of anger. Don't fall into the trap of sadness. 
while those emotions are real, and while there have been times this week that I have been sad, while there have been times this week that I have been angry, I can confidently say, and I can't do this very often because I make up a lot of mistakes, but I can confidently say during this week when I got angry or when I got sad or when I got depressed, I reached out to someone and I shared that with them. Because I didn't want to wallow in it. Why did I do that? Because I know if the devil wants to do anything during this time, he wants to shut the church down. Lock the doors. Online streaming only. Can't have more than 10 people. He is reveling in this. And we as a church need to stand back up. And more than ever, we need to be engaged. And we need to be shining the light brighter than we've ever shown it before. Listen, they can shut down a building, but they cannot shut down the gospel. They can take away sports, but they cannot take away our faith. They can take away schools, but they cannot take away the hope that we have in Christ. They can take away a lot of stuff, but they cannot take away Jesus. Listen. I'm challenging you now more than ever. If you're watching this on Facebook Live, you have a Facebook account. Get on that account and start sharing memes that are hopeful. Start making posts that project hope. Start encouraging people in your circle of influence that, yeah, we may be walking through something right now, but guess what? Sunday's coming. Start sharing Jesus. Pick up a phone. Make a phone call to somebody that you love. Send a text. This is our time to shine. While the world is going to respond in chaos and while the world is going to bombard us with fear and while the world is going to do everything in its power to keep us down, this is a time where we step up and we shine. Guys, we live and we walk by faith not by sight. We live sacrificially, not selfishly. And we shine the light of Christ in times like this. We don't hide it. Imagine the impact that we can have in this community Imagine the impact that we can have when we put these three principles into practice. Imagine the impact that we can have because the world is acting the way the world is acting because they're scared. The world is acting the way they're acting because they're confused. The world is acting the way they're acting because they're angry. The world is acting the way they're acting because ultimately they're lost. And now more than ever, we have an opportunity, if we will live by the principles that we say we believe, we have an opportunity to show people that our faith is stronger than our sight, that our generosity outweighs our selfishness, and that our light can penetrate through any darkness. And so I'm going to close with this. A statement that I read, it's one of those positive things that somebody sent me, and I want to throw it up on the screen. Hopefully you can see it on the live. If not, I'll, turn it. I'll, I'll just read it to you. And I really believe this. We have proven over the years, we have proven over the years that we can go to church. Now let's see if we can be the church. This is our time and our moment to take the gospel into a hurting world. And we need to do it through our faith, through our generosity, and through shining our light. Will you jump on board with me? Let's go change the world. Let's pray. We're going to sing another song. I invite you, if you're at home, stand up after I pray and worship. Father God, thank you for a word that was spoken by a man 
hundreds of miles away that somebody sent me that really changed the trajectory of my week. Thank you that in those times when I do get down and I do get angry and I do get frustrated, thank you that I have people around me that can hold that and can encourage me. Thank you that I didn't stay there all week long. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us in this time. Father, when, when Acts 2 was written, they weren't running from a virus. They were running from people that wanted to kill them physically. They had no technology, and yet they changed the world. And so here we are, a small country church in the middle of nowhere, and you're calling us now in a time of crisis to step out and to live faithfully and to live generously and to shine. So Father, if you're calling us to do that, give us the strength, give us the power to do it. May you change this community. May we see more people come to Christ than we've ever seen before. As your church spreads the hope of the gospel, 3,000 people were added to the church in Acts 2 because of the generosity and the faithfulness of that church. What will you do here? So we stand in all of you and we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.